Just give me 30 seconds for it to propagate here. Okay. Here we are for Ralph Allen Macy's discussion, DeAndre Santi on his 60 years of art, beginning momentarily. I'll give a little walk through of the show. Is this your guest here? Capturing the exhibit. Yes. yes. Wow, so was I. How are you? Oh, good enough. Here I am. We're looking forward to this talk. Lovely. We're very happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and, you know, as it, a part of this retrospective, 60 years of your work, and it's, it must be such a problem for you. It's just as much as it is for us to have you here. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's the most compelling about your work is you make magic out of things that, that you know people tend to ignore and you know with pasting and, and cutting and you know, the carpentry behind it and um, the sanding of the wood it, there's so many you know aspects to your work that you know involves a lot of you know really meticulous attention and, uh, and you do it with such dedicated craftsmanship and you know Six decades to be exact of dedicated craftsmanship. And that's something to really be part of. And uh, I think for me, the first time I came into contact with your work is, is, was last February. It was the LA Art Show. And we, there was a collector who came in the part of work and he happened to be a comic book writer. I don't remember his name, but I, I remember he was a writer for the show in the comic Riverdale. Um, and he had like when I when I, I remember going back and like, doing some research on the internet, I knew that he had done some work for Marvel comic books and things like that. And so then I know that that's a focal point of a lot of the work that you do. Um, and so I think with with any of us, it's always really interesting to know, you know where they're from and, and how that environment affects their art. So can you tell us more about where you're from and how that affects your process? Well, um, I was born and grew up in Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. And um, I guess anyone who had um, grown up in a, uh, a Midwest industrialized city um, really wouldn't understand the pressures that are on the young blue collar person like myself. And so anything having to do with the steel industry and the automobile industry, it just kind of presupposed that the option, those are the two options that uh, things that you can do with your life. And so only after getting out of Detroit when I was 18 was I able to begin to realize who I was or who I could be. Uh, when I was eight years old, I remember distinctly my mother taking me to the Detroit Art Institute, which is the museum there. And I could describe virtually everything I saw that day. Out in front was a bronze copy of a band's thinker. There was a Greco Roman uh, marble of Leah Kuhn and his sons dressed in it to act by servants, and on and on. And uh, I, I was just like, I'd been in the dark and all of a sudden there was a light on and I realized this could be me. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty neat because my father had been working in a steel mill and all I knew prior to that was a couple of blocks within um, and everybody around us worked in the steel mill and took the bottom of the street. And so um, right. I shortly after I did lose my parents and spent uh, uh, the next 10 years in 
In a long day course in journey, where where do you typically find inspiration to create your work? Um, I'd have to say that it were uh, I uh, interested very much in art history and natural history subjects. Uh, I figured my mom would be in her work. And when I started uh, uh, going to auctions where there were uh, auctions of antique movie posters, it really again was kind of like a light came on. In my life, I realized these things were all done in the stone lithography process that traditional fine art comes from. It. And really began to investigate it and to put together a collection of auction catalogs. The uh, posters themselves could be very expensive, uh, especially certain themes of science fiction uh, monsters like King Kong, but that uh, I could acquire a catalog. 25 and bucks and have essentially what I wanted was the occurrence of those things. I realized that there was a whole series. I mean, I became more involved with the history of the poster making, that there was a whole series of posters that might be based on one movie. And then when there's a remake of a film like King Kong, there have been three or four of them already, that there's a whole series of posters and then it's into the posters that are made internationally when a movie would go to Spain, for instance, or Italy, that the new poster would be made. And so there was just a trove of material that I could dig into. And I know that um, I, in, a, in a sense, I'm being an homage to the artists who worked on those things, many of whom remained anonymous. And some of, them, some of the posters were made by the artists, but um, I was uh, designed to do an homage. Them, I was trying to build on what they had done, that um, uh, I never did uh, use any of the, this material verbatim. I would alter it, you know, try and find inventive ways to do a series using that just as a platform to start the day up. And so, starting uh, with the film posters, connected with that, some very famous characters like Robbie the Robot in uh, one of the the name of the film actually, but they were set up on a film band and a poster band. But I, uh, this Rocco Robot set me on a uh, course of collecting antique toys that were created in robots. There's a few others uh, that they that just kind of aliens from outer space and uh, war of the worlds. And they, and they all have a uh, robot, some mechanical mess that's definitely not a universe or world. And um, very savvy people had marketed these things and turned into a series of these toys. So I started buying them. I have it, and right now I have a fairly large collection of old tin toys. And I've been watching that long. And I've been working on the question of my work. And I've been working on the question of my work. But my interest in painting has three different aspects of it. Number one, the design, number two, the color, 
survey the last of the subject. So only after I've got on the subject, which is talking to so what you see is the finished thing and the composition of color are pretty much taken for granted, I think, by the average viewer, but without other elements, the picture would just be a picture. Oh, okay, absolutely, absolutely. And, and with that magic that, that I described, I think many of us would want to know how did how did you develop your artistic abilities? You know, I, we know you know where you found some of the you know sources and you know some of the uh, inspirations. But how did you develop your your individual artistic ability? I think I think um, talent develops with opportunities, not just with me, but with, with anybody. And that uh, four years in the Navy uh, gave you know kind of focused me, but I really didn't have a chance to um, uh, uh, look into materials and processes. I was very limited to what I could do four years aboard ship. Um, uh, getting out of the Navy, I remember a really down period when I was buying large pieces of co cardboard to paint. <laughs> Actually, I would go to the main company and they'd have a, a, a sale on broken tubes of paint. I started out with uh, uh, buying a quart of beer once a month, which big celebration for us. But I you know, worked, put my pennies together, uh, found a friend who was uh, teaching ceramics at LA City College. And uh, he got to the point where he trusted me with the key to the kiln room. So pretty soon I was doing sculpture. My wife had taken uh, ceramic classes and came home with a sack of clay. And all of a sudden I was doing sculpture rather than just painting because I had been painting before I had it. And then um, uh, was able to turn those into fire clay uh, sculptures. One of which is in the show where you really were supposed to see the show. See the figure of a man that I did that thing. And um, uh, I had to uh, find a separate studio because I was in a, a little two room apartment above a laundromat at the time. And I thought, this is just I'm doing, I'm putting seven pounds into a five pound bag here. I have to find a bigger space. Found a studio, started building kilns to do the ceramics work. That led into bronze casting, and I built furnaces and ovens for doing the lost wax bronze casting process. Really got into it. And um, but just, I, I spent about 40 years and I, most of the shows that I had in the galleries were on the sculpture. And the, I continued with the drawing and painting, but it was kind of pushed in the background. The beginning of this century, and this takes a big leap, you know, 40 years up to the beginning. Of this century, I figured I had done what I could with sculpture. At the painting, I felt that uh, just the nature of sculpture and the mass and the bomb that I appreciated the sense of weight to it was limited as far as the variety of compositions that you had in the three dimensions. That there was a form floating in space, something had to be folded up, it was suspended from the ceiling. A prop up from the bottom. Whereas in a painting, I could put a man floating in space, and uh, it was taken for granted that he was in space and he was weightless because he didn't allow that. And so, uh, as I continued with the painting, the early ones were all framed. And I realized why are they framed in the paint? It's a practical thing it protects the corners and the edges of the surface, which bugs and stains it off. But what it does, it puts the viewer. Inside or outside the window, looking at the edge. And so when you're looking at a frame of painting, um, you're either outside of the, of the building looking in, which gives you a kind of a furtive quality, you know, you're a spy or you're asleep, or you're on the inside looking out, wondering who is that spy or sleep out there. But you're, you're polarized that way. And when you take a painting out of the frame, it has the effect of putting the viewer into the same environment. As a subject, I thought this is really cool. It's such a simple thing that uh, 
you're going to get that sense of immediacy, and you're wanting to have a narrative quality to it. And so, putting the viewer right into the environment, I felt it has to enhance it. So, that, since that time, I just I stopped with the creating. A few things have assimilated for me. They're the kind of painting, which is part of the subject, but it, um, uh, I wanted that that quality of either being inside, being protected by the environment, and looking out for the door of the world. And then also, um, still life of the, of the um, portraiture and landscape genre, still life is probably the least respectable. Uh, in the past, uh, that people thought, okay, it's a bowl of fruit, a vase of flowers. You now, some painters do this, do still life. I wanted to approach still life with making it more respectable, making it more challenging. And so I've been working towards that goal. It's like a fine challenge. You know, still life is a new life. And prior to me, of course, I'm mean, not the only person that confronted this in the family. Working around 1910, 1920, something like that, uh, and uh, looked at still life. He started giving them a narrative quality. Took still life off of the table, put a lot of his still life on the wall. And again, you know, trying to break the tradition. So um, pretty much brings that brings us up to today. It just kind of uh, uh, stopped along you know through various stages of development. And so all of the elements that from the past, I've continued to bring them along with me. The, the baggage that I'm carrying gets heavier and heavier each year. And I'm wondering, you know, can I hold on to all of these things or should it, is it time to cut some of them loose? And so, uh, you know, I suppose in the average person's professional life, that's you reach different plateaus where you make decisions. Do you want to stop doing expressive work and just focus on shapes and angular subjects, get rid of organic shapes. And you know, these are just decisions that an artist might make, but I'm sure in anyone's professional life, you get to a plateau where you, you make decisions what fork in the road you want to go down. And having a show where I have all this stuff put up on the wall for God and everybody to look at, um, and I have a chance to see all you know this context. Not just edges of things sticking out of the storage rack. Mm -hmm. Have an opportunity to decide what fork in the road I want to go down. So the gallery has done me a very large favor without realizing it. Um, I mean, I can see it. Nice. So speaking of the various. And I feel like there must be so many stories involved with every piece here because they happen throughout your life, throughout the span of your life. Um, and so what I want to know is how has your art, 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 artistic styles changed over time? Well, um, something that Om did, you know, we had a discussion before the show was set up. And since it covers 60 years, the natural thing might say, but it, in a chronology, with the oldest pieces at one end and the newest on the other, that uh, um, spent some time uh, dividing things up into related subjects, related styles. And because there's quite a bit of overlap, as I said, I'm dragging this baggage behind me from, you know, I just refuse to throw out anything usable from the past. And um, it's given me the opportunity to see some of these things in that context for the first time. There are some things that were I found, uh, like say traditionally cartoons of a black outline. Well, plain air painters would tell you there are no black outlines in nature. And, but I'm not a plain air painter. And I think that in some situations that those outlines are appropriate to, uh, to push a particular kind of composition. Uh, some Japanese uh, woodblock prints before our American comics developed use a hard dark outline like that around subjects, and it becomes a compositional element. Having a little trouble with my eyes with cataracts, and I, I know I used to do uh, my layouts in a very white pencil line, which would end up being completely 
buried under layers of paint. Now I'm finding I have to use a, uh, a heavy dark paint outline to incorporate that into the composition. So leaning more that way, in some ways going backward to a time when I have been using more of a hard outline rather than a softened edge. And uh, so I just I, I go back and forth. I really, uh, I said, I just I don't find it possible to turn loose of anything. I want to keep reusing things. And for this show, actually, the other uh, thing an opportunity that I had was to revisit actual works. Very often, I have a stream of ideas that are constantly. I wake up sometime in the middle of the night, or you know, have an idea of working on one thing. I jump over and work on something else. And uh, with this show, I decided to redo a lot of other works. And uh, I started thinking of it as an offset, like a branch coming off of a tree. And I would take a uh, composition that I had done previously and use one little section, rearrange it. And uh, so I've done uh, well, close to 60 of these offsets in the last couple of months, just bang, bang, bang. Uh, getting all of these things out of my chest if I thought there was enough material left to work with, you know, that I could go on. And so it's become a big feature of this show that Thomas put together some of the offsets with the, with the prototypes or the principal painting. And that has been just a global experience for me, yeah. uh, which I, I, I really value that. I think that uh, if you're not growing, it's sure it's going back to and so uh, anything that gives you an opportunity to push you in new direction to refocus on ground that I've already covered and to you know, open up a few avenues, I'm all for that. Uh, education is a cure for most of the world's problems. It seems to be for me. I, uh, I know that that's constantly stimulating. So there's a work in the show that I find really interesting. Uh, it's a bit different from the other groups, and it's called X from Eden. And, and in that work, you painted yourself into the portrait. Can you tell us a little bit why you made the decision to paint yourself into the portrait and what type of significance does it have for you and, and what you want to convey to the audience? I see several variations of that one, and they're not all in the show, but I think it's nice one because it's very interesting. As I mentioned, I, I figured that the natural history is a lot of birds, fish, you name it, everything that's out there that moves and breathes. And uh, uh, I know that genetically, we're not that far away from uh, monkeys and apes. A lot of scientific uh, experimenting is done. Uh, Use, unfortunately, using them as subjects because it's about as close as they can come of them using uh, human subjects to experiment on. So, I think there was family members in species wearing extension of birds. Very first off, <laughs> I guess I can, I don't want to talk too long about this because I just. I'll go on all day. But uh, so that I think of my family. And um, right now, a human race is basically the closest thing to Eden, as you could imagine. I mean, we have so many luxuries. We have food and shelter, you know, and comfort beyond the wildest imaginations. Uh, people just a couple hundred years ago couldn't have imagined that we'd have the luxuries that we have right now. And at the same time, these related species are being driven into extinction. They're, they're being used by as food crops. They're being used as trophies. Um, it just, I mean, it's so much beneath us. I can't believe it. And yet, it is. There, there are people who don't agree with me, obviously. You know, and so those people, uh, those those creatures, my family, have been exiled from Eden. I'm here. Looking out at them, I'm, I'm inside the room looking through the window at them. And uh, so that's basically what it is. I feel sorry for them. Um, I think the best thing that I could do as an artist is discuss the subject. I don't think artists necessarily predict the future, but they can report on their times. 
and this is what I see happening in my time is environmental uh, loss and outright uh, species being killed off. Um, it just, uh, it's a uh, bad side of uh, human civilization. And um, if we do end up uh, in centuries to come out in outer space, I'd like to think that some of these related species will be out there with us, that they'll be a place if, uh, you know, if all of that does happen, if education continues to make the human race more knowledgeable about everything that we're doing and part of that, um, that some of the, you know, we are aware that we're communicating with whales, with porpoises, and, you know, with all the simian species. And so, okay, that kind of sums up. Well, it seems to be a lot of purpose that we're going to do the new world. And I think the typical field probably did not notice or appreciate. Um, but with, with that being said, all these things, how would you say you define success as an artist? How do you define, how do you define success? Well, success for me happens every day in the studio. I told Tom and I delivered the work for the show. I said, the last couple of months have been mine. Now, the next month is yours. <laughs> because I already had the pleasure of making the work. And um, it's kind of like I passed it on, you know, it's a relay race. And that um, Tom had the opportunity to present the work to people. And um, I turned it from a monologue to be talking to myself in my studio to the dialogue with the rest of the world. Yourself and uh, the other part of the team that's been working on the exhibit uh, is doing that very thing or making that success happen if it's going to happen at all. I don't think it's necessary to be uh, uh, that international fame, you know, to become extremely wealthy. I have my bills paid, I'm comfortable, I don't have dependents, and uh, my estate plan is made every day that I can get up and continue from work. Is He said, I couldn't do this in India. 
She said, I can't make a living in an artist. And I was supporting myself at the time. You know, it wasn't my career, so I was supporting myself. And I was selling so I came in and actually <laughs> I got I really am lucky. So very quickly at that place at that time that I was interviewing a lot of these young men. And um uh I wish I could have shared it with them. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have to say it is possible. Thank you. 